Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Johnson. Here we are at the Church of Royal um, in the sanctuary. You can see in the background, we've got uh, our beautiful stained glass window. We've got over here, stained glass window over the door. And what's right in the middle? We've got that star, that six-pointed star. Um, for most of us, we are, we're, we're already aware that that represents the Star of David. David was the was the second king of Israel. On the list behind me, right here, you may not be able to see it. Come to the sanctuary, you can. Right here. David. David's father was Jesse. David's father was Jesse. What's that got to do with this service? Well, the texts are pretty pretty clear on that because it mentions Jesse's name twice. Uh, we're going to get to that. So um, obviously here we are. We're in the uh, second Sunday of Advent. And right here we have these four Advent candles. Um, we lit the first one last week, Advent 1, Advent 2. It's really interesting today. We're talking about Advent 2, meaning um, it's the second Sunday of Advent. But there's also a kind of a play on words. We're not just talking about the birth of Jesus. We're talking about the second advent, the time that he's going to come the second time, which is going to be the end of the age. So I'd like to uh, begin our, our time together with a couple readings. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the first one is from Isaiah chapter 11, and it starts off by saying the very first thing. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, that's, that's a, a reference to uh, David's father. Why is that important? Because one of the covenants that God made with all the people of Israel was that a, a descendant of David would always be on the throne of Israel for eternity. And the descendant of uh, David that we're talking about is the person of Jesus Christ. He is called the son of David. He's also called the son of man, which we spoke about previously. Um, I'll just read this portion. I'm going to ask if you wouldn't mind, just hit your, hit your pause button as you go out and get your scriptures and read this. It's Isaiah chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Okay. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its, his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. For the earth, this is verse 9, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day... The, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for his people. The nations will rally to him, and, at, and his place of rest will be glorious. There's a lot of stuff packed in there. There's a lot of imagery packed in there. Um, the next passage is from uh, Romans, and it also talks about it also talks about this root of Jesse. Let me begin from Romans chapter 15, verses four through eight. You may just want to take a, a minute to scramble to get that. Romans 15, verses 4 through 8. This is really key for us. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we may have hope. Uh, you probably noticed that. It's the endurance of Scriptures. We really need to know what Scriptures have to say. Now, I, I know that right now... Um, Across the, across the country, there's not a whole lot of people that read the scriptures. We can, we can say what we want, but the fact is, we know that Bible reading is down. People just don't do it. Why? Various reasons. They don't have time. There's no interest. Um, a lot of kids say, what's the difference? What does it matter? Well, um, there was a time when we adhered to scriptures. There was a time when um, governments, the governments of our country and other countries, other nations, adhered very close to what Scripture had to say. They knew what it was. 
I have told a number of times incidents where people in history have simply quoted one or two words and immediately the populace of the nation would know exactly what they were talking about. Certain phrases would come to mind and people would know. People would know. Um, if you take a look on the banner that's hanging up behind the candles, there's four words, four words. Watch, prepare, rejoice, and behold. Now, in not too long ago, uh, many people in our communities, many people in our churches, when we said those words, if in the context of a, of a Christian life, you said those words, people snapped to attention because they knew that it was to watch, what it meant to prepare, what it meant to rejoice, what it meant to behold. So we're visiting this all again. And here's, here's the point of what I want to say. Today is the second Sunday in Advent. According to what it says up there, it says the word what? What's it say? It says prepare. Now we're in the we're we're entering into the this is the this is the uh, the Advent season. We're not at, not at Christmas yet. When we get to Christmas Day, then we celebrate Christmas. We're in the Advent season. We're building up to it. But you see, Jesus was born two thousand years ago. We know that. But we're not building up to his birth. What are we building up to? We're building up to his return. Now, for little kids, this may be a chance for them to sort of celebrate again or just get ready for the presents and Santa Claus and all, and all that. And I understand that. We are simply repeating, renewing, um, practicing, as it were, practicing for when Christ comes the second time. He's already come the first time, but he's going to be coming the second time. And it says right here, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. Teach us what? So that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. You see, right now, you and I, the people that are, that are in this video, and there's, well, there's nobody in the room except me and you. So between the, the two of us, you and I, we have a chance to not only renew and review, we can see with new eyes what it means to tell others that don't know. Because if we know, we desire to share with others so that they will know. Isn't that what we do? What do we do at Christmas time? We review the things that happen. We review the story. We review the story and we're making preparations, our minds and our hearts, because we are coming to closer, and I mentioned this several weeks ago, we're, meant, we're, we're getting closer to the event when Christ will come again. Not as a baby, but as a king. As the king that will come and reign over us. Okay, um, verse 5 of Romans chapter 15. May the Lord who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify God and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will also rule over all the nations, and the Gentiles will hope in him. It's a pretty big statement because we're talking about a Jewish man, the descendant of a Jewish man, talks about all the others, all the nations will have hope in that descendant of that Jewish man. May the God of hope fill you with all joy so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, four, four weeks in Advent. The first one is, is watch, prepare, behold, and rejoice. That's what we're building up to. Today, we're talking about preparation. This passage from uh, Matthew chapter 3 talks about our old buddy, our old friend, um, John the Baptist. We know the story. We rehearse this story several times a year. The key, there's a couple of key words in there. One is repent, one is prepare, and one is produce. Repent, prepare, and produce. What does that mean? Well, I think they're pretty exciting because... Um, 
uh, let me let me read the first uh, several verses. I'll read the first. I'll read the first uh, four verses. This is from Matthew chapter three, one through four. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near." This is he who has spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. This was spoken by Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was born. It comes true, it's coming to fruition that which was predicted 700 years before Jesus was born, this guy shows up. And for many, it was like a kind of a ghostly apparition. It was, who is this guy? What is he saying? Well, he's actually quoting the Old Testament passages. And people are thinking, hold it. We've heard about this for 700 years, probably 20 generations. Could this be, could this be the time? Is, is, is this guy serious? So it says, the people went out to see him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. The man was making huge strides because he was coming out into the desert, not in town, but outside. So people wanted to hear this guy. They went out to a place, no other diversions, no other items of interest, this guy was talking some pretty serious stuff. And when he spoke, people's hearts were changed. What does it take to change an individual's heart? A recognition that something they're doing is probably not the best. He uses that word, repent. That word repent, it's got a really interesting phrase. It means uh, to exercise the mind, to think, and to comprehend something that needs to change. There's a change that needs to take place. I'll give you this one small example. I've, I've heard this, I heard this example probably 20 years ago. A friend of mine's a doctor. She's a very good and a very competent physician. She knows her stuff. Living in this foreign country, this, there was a man that came up to her. He had an issue, a problem, he had a malady that was getting worse and worse. And my friend said, you know, you really need to take this medicine. And, he, and she wrote the prescription for this, this man to take. And he didn't take it. And he came in probably once, I don't know, once a month, maybe every three to five weeks. He kept coming in. And my friend was telling me, this guy likes to argue. He likes to argue. Maybe he likes to argue with her because she's a woman and he's a man in that culture. They supposedly thought they had better insight. But she's a competent physician. And she said, have you taken the medicine? No, but I've come here to talk with you. And so they would talk. Some of you have heard this story. He would come in time after time and he never took the medicine, never took the medicine. So what was the point? He thought that he was smarter than the doctor Yet he knew that he needed help. What did he need to do? What do you think he needed to do? You know as well as I do what he needed to do. He was given the recipe. He was given the, the, the medicine. He was, he was told what needs to change, but he was adamant he was not going to take the medicine. Finally, in frustration, she says, look, you keep coming in here. I keep telling you what you need to do. I'm telling you this medicine will help. But you need to take it. You need to alter your lifestyle. Take the medicine. Stop doing the things you're doing. Take the medicine and prepare to be healed. Prepare to be healed. You need to repent of your current behavior, change your direction, change your, 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 your focus, and take the medicine that I give you. He never did. He just kept walking away. Well, I don't know if he died um, because this was so. Oh, this was many years ago. I left uh, before I found out the results of that little encounter between that man and that, that physician. Why wouldn't he do it? Because he was headstrong and he thought, I'm going to do what I want to do. He liked the idea of arguing. He liked the idea of 
pushed back. I don't need to do that. I'll, well, he did. This whole idea of repentance means you need to change gears, change direction, and change your pace. It, say, it, it says here, it says here in reference to John the Baptist, it says, it says this in the book of Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. It's the voice calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. We know there's a need for preparation for all of us, be it our education, uh, we see a lot of people whose diets are just terrible. And we can readily tell them, you know, you need to stop that and start this. You need to stop that. You need to stop that. We see people's lives consumed by all sorts of, and I'll use the word addictions. They consume things either with their eyes, with their stomachs, with their mouths. They consume things with their ears. And they do those things to feel some sort of comfort. People often say the word to me, I like my comfort food. Your comfort and food may give you comfort, but is it causing you damage? What is the things that you and I need to do to alter the direction that we're taking to comply with what God has for us? Now, there's a lot of stuff we can take. We have our relatives, our friends, our moms and dads would always tell us, don't eat so much ice cream, don't eat all that stuff. You need to eat, you need to eat a better diet. We know that's true. If you want to make it to 70 or 80, you can't eat junk. You know what I'm saying. It says, prepare the way, make straight paths for the Lord. Straight paths means kick off the, the obstacles on your path. Kick those out of the way so you don't stumble over them and no one else does either. Then it goes down to this, and this is the, this is the verb that I really like. When he saw that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Or say, good word, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit. I was told just last night by a, a colleague of mine, what is the fruit that is being produced? Is there fruit in your ministry? Is there fruit in your life? If there is fruit, what does it look like? And the good question is, is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? We are called upon to produce fruit. John tells us, John chapter 15 tells us, we need to produce fruit, fruit that will last. Here it says, produce, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. If we're going to change our direction, what is it that we can change so that the good fruit is produced? What do we do with that good fruit? The good fruit, very oftentimes, is not just the labors that we do. It's the results that are seen in the, commun the community where we live and the children that we have. What is the fruit that's produced? Now, I don't want to go down that road too far. Uh, we can't always control what our children do. We can't control how they act. We can't control how they think. We can prepare them. We can encourage them to make that preparation, to make straight those paths. But if they fail to do that, that's not necessarily a reflection on the moms and dads or the grandparents or, or aunts or uncles. It's our responsibility to make sure that we comply with these, with these um, directives. Repent, prepare, and produce. Produce, act, produce fruit that will that, show, that leads, that is led to by repentance. It says here, the ax is ready at the roots of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. <whistles> Pretty harsh. Why do I mention that? Remember, this little message is not about preparing for Christmas on the 25th of December. This message is about preparing for the second coming when the Lord comes back. Is this, pretty, is this a pretty harsh message? Is this harsh? How many of us desire, we desire to have words spoken to us that reflect the needs, the things we need to do to make preparation for when the end comes? 
I'm not talking about, I am talking about the end of, end of the age. What about the end of the year? I put in a, um, I wrote in our newsletter, uh, it's just coming out in the last couple of days. The, uh, the newsletter talks about there's a beginning and there's an end. There's always beginnings and there's always endings. Right now, we're ending, well, the, the harvest has come for the farmers. It's the end of their season. So there's this rejoicing that the end is there. The end is complete. Now the, the, the crops are in, they're in the bins, the money's in the bank, that sort of thing. Um, but there's other, the end of the year is coming. Financial records will be closed down, things like that. There's also beginnings. There's beginnings and there's ends. What we're looking at today, right now, is what is going to be coming in the future. God has a plan. And his plan is that he wants us to make sure that we're prepared. I'll give you this illustration. There's a lot of us that know people. We can remember those individuals that have touched our lives in great ways. I'm thinking of our the ancestors, our grandpas and grandmas and moms and dads. I'm thinking of the man right now that was our neighbor years ago. He was there on the day of the armistice in 1918. I made a point to go up and talk to him. I said, um, I asked him some questions about what it was like to be in the Great War. Uh, that's been over 100 years. That's 100 104 years ago. Well, I asked him some questions. What do I need to know? And he told me, these are the things you need to know. I've been a school teacher for oh, probably 15 years. Kids would always ask, what do I need to know? What do I need to know? And the most common question was, Mr. Johnson, am I going to need to know this for the test? What kind of a question is that? Of course you're going to need to know it for the test. Why am I covering this? Mr. Johnson, do, are we going to need to know this part or this part? And I'll say, whatever I'm talking about, you need to be responsible for all these parts. Otherwise, otherwise why am I telling you? All these words that the scripture talks about, they indicate something we need to be prepared for. The question is often, as I say, is always asked, am I going to need this? Am I going to need this for the test? Is there going to be a test? The test is going to happen, but the test is in your life. How you live your life, how others see it. The things that you've learned and applied in your life, that's the test. And the proof of the test, as it says here, the producing good fruit that comes part and partial along the way, but ultimately the Lord looks at us and he, he, he sees us, do we trust in Jesus? Do we have this profound, maybe, maybe just a simple faith in Jesus? But is Jesus at the tip of our tongue? Is he the first thought in our hearts? The Lord wants us to make sure that we're prepared for him. It says, prepare, uh, prepare for the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. So on this occasion for this, this season of Advent, let's prepare our hearts and ask the questions of those around us and say, tell me what I need to do. Don't just come to me. There's lots of people in our community. Ask them, what is it that the Lord would have me do? Ask those questions. You'd be surprised at the wisdom that will be shared with you by your, by your colleagues, most of all for your el by your elders. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the preparations that we are now involved in. We are being taught and prepared for steps that you would have us to take to make straighter paths for ourselves in which people may follow not only our actions, but specifically your words. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thanks for coming. Um, next week, Advent 3, 3, and we're, we're counting down to 4, and then Christmas, and then we're going to be having a gracious new year that comes. Blessings to you. Bye now.